Hi, I'm Zibby Owens, the creator and host of the award-winning podcast that you're listening to right now, thank you so much, called Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. It is a daily podcast, 365 days a year, and each day we talk to an author about all of the things related to their career, their book, their life, and more in 30 minutes or less, because who has time? I am now an author myself, although I wasn't when I started this podcast, and you can get my new memoir, Bookends, a memoir of love, loss, and literature, wherever books are sold starting July 1st, and my children's book, Princess Charming. You can learn more about me at zibbyowens.com, but really, you're here to learn more about the authors, and that is what we're going to do. Also, be sure to check out all the other podcasts in the Zcast Podcast Network. You can learn more at zcastnetwork.com. Dot com and definitely check out those shows as well. Also, just a quick note that submissions for the Zibby Awards are open and will close on September 15th. Go to zibbyowens.com and you will find the Zibby Awards open submissions where we celebrate all the under-celebrated parts of a book, like the best spine, the best author's note, the best table of contents. And authors can nominate their own best publicists, best editors, and so on. There will be an in-person award ceremony in October in New York. You will not want to miss it. Go to zibbyowens.com. Natasha Lunn is the author of Conversations on Love. Lovers, strangers, parents, friends, endings, beginnings. Natasha is an author, journalist, and features director at Red Magazine. Her debut book is Conversations on Love, which has grown out of the newsletter of the same name. And to further understand her understanding of love and relationships, Natasha studied an introductory course to psychotherapy at the Tavistock Relationship Center in 2018, which informed the writing of this wonderful book. Welcome, Natasha. Thank you so much for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books to discuss conversations on love, lovers, strangers, parents, friends, endings, beginnings. Thank you so much for having me. You had such an interesting model for this book and how it started and your whole uh, newsletter and everything. Why don't you explain how this turned into a book just to give everybody a little background about it and then we'll dig in. So yeah, I started an email newsletter, maybe must be like four and a half, nearly five years ago now. And it was really born out of my own embarrassments in love and my my understanding that really I had just completely misunderstood what love was for a very long time and just spent, like many of us do, most of my life trying to find somebody to love me and not really thinking about what that word meant to me. And and kind of doing lots of interviews as a journalist and, you know, you have to speak to people about their career, their history, their bio, all this stuff, and you get like maybe a little paragraph about love. But I would always find like I wanted to spend a whole hour interview talking about love because the more I asked about it, the more the answers gave me more questions. And I just realized that actually this is what we should be devoting more time to. So I started doing that really thinking that it would never take the shape of a book. You know, I, I just never thought that that would happen. And then as I was doing the interviews, it just became really clear to me that people who were writing into me were really coming with three questions, which was either how do I find love? Like whether that was somebody looking for love for the first time or looking for love after divorce or even not wanting a relationship and looking for where they could find love in other areas of their life. How to sustain love, like people who are just like fraught with kids and parents and relationships just trying to figure out how to sustain those relationships through life's many storms. And then thirdly, how do we survive and find meaning after love, after losing love and people losing love in all these different ways. So I just, it was like a weird process. It came, it almost like came to life through the questions that people were asking me. And and I started to think, hang on, this, this isn't how love moves through the course of a life because we're all going to be asking those questions at different points. And I find myself now moving between the sections of the book. Like, sadly, there will be years when I lose love and then, you know, years when friendships are changing and I I need to find it again in different places. And I just realized that those are three questions we're hopefully all going to be asking throughout our life. And I hadn't found a book yet that gave them the attention I thought that they deserved. Interesting. Well, it has certainly become a very interesting book. And I couldn't believe how many guests on my podcast you had as interviews in the book. There's so much overlap. And here, I tried to dog ear all the ones that 
we had overlap, but of course now I can't even find them. But anyway, so many, um, so many overlaps. In fact, I interviewed Candace Carty Williams yesterday and oh, I, forgot, wow. I forgot to ask her about what you wrote in your book about losing her friends. And now I feel terrible about that. But anyway, there, anyway, just a lot of, uh, a lot of overlap. Lisa Tadeo, Heather Haverleski, Alanda Botom, Mira Jacob, so many more. So Anyway, great authors. You include your own life story in here from taking you from single days and wanting to combat the loneliness and the endless questions when before you're in a relationship of how to meet and where and what's going to happen and all that stuff, all the way through to becoming a mother and the tenuous, you know, deeply emotional journey and the twists and turns involved in that. And I don't know how much you want to share here or would like to divulge in the book, but I would love to hear about even the later stage of, of becoming a mom and what you had to go through for that, if you don't mind. Yeah, of course. And just thinking about that, the reason that I wanted to go back and share bits of my own life in, in all of those, I guess, vulnerable moments it's because I had read a lot of books by experts and some of the people I interview are amazing experts who are writing from a real position of knowledge and authority. But I wanted to come to this and sort of say, you know, I'm making these mistakes every day. I don't, I don't know anything. I'm really like learning hopefully with the reader as you go and probably making worse mistakes than, than everybody else. Because I realized that however many lessons you can learn about love and in the beginning, as you say, I was writing about just feeling like I would never meet a romantic partner and seeing that as the only thing that could make me happy. And then, of course, when I was in a romantic relationship, feeling a similar way about trying to conceive, like suddenly this became the thing that I had to had to achieve to be happy, sort of completely overlooking this wonderful romantic relationship that I had been spent the last decade before. So I really wanted to, sh- to show how easily you know, for anybody else who's longing for romantic love, how easily, if we let that be the model that we can kind of slip into it again and again, no matter what form of love we have, we can overlook it. But yeah, so the book ends with me becoming a mother. And, you know, now again, I I sort of wrote a little bit about the early stages of motherhood in that, because I didn't want it to be this happy ending, because of course, with every love story, it's just another beginning which is full of deep joy and also more deep challenges. And I have just found it to be so interesting thinking about how to sustain romantic love and friendship and all all the other forms of love that I was able to devote a lot of time to in the space of motherhood. And, And that's where I'm at now, really having to fight almost to retain space for the other forms of love that I spent that whole book learning are so important. And yeah, I'm what's... sure with four children, you um, probably are a lot more of an expert on this. <laughs> I am not at all. I was hoping for your advice, you know, what have you, what have you figured out that has worked, you know, to sustain romantic love in the face of constant stress and interruption and all the rest? Well, what I would say, and it's so hard to talk about this because I feel that I'm always saying, I'm, I'm always kind of talking down maternal love and that's not, the case at all but I think because we put it on this huge pedestal and we do say you know people say like oh I haven't felt love like this until I become a parent and and we kind of I guess like some people fetishize it in that way in an interesting way it's made me so grateful for the freedom of romantic love in that I'm always amazed by parental like parental love feels so intense and so loaded with like guilt and it's almost sometimes feel like it's not a choice. It's just this, it's so overwhelming and intense. With romantic love, I feel it's much more of a choice and something that we have freedom within and and we kind of keep choosing. Whereas I feel almost with motherhood, I don't have room for a choice because it's just, it's like in me somehow. And it's, I don't know if you feel the same. Yeah, I totally know what you mean. (laughs) And, And there's a level of, you know, I don't have fear for my, obviously I whenever you're in a romantic relationship and you build a life with someone, it's terrifying when you think about losing them. But what I love about romantic love is we, we're each responsible for each other. And that's a very different dynamic in love than in parental love where you are responsible for them mm-hmm. and, and the kind of crushing responsibility that comes with that. So whilst it has given me challenges in romantic love, it also just made me appreciate the ease of that relationship in 
in some ways and the lack of responsibility and fear you have for that person and how you're supported by them in a way that's as, as two individuals has made me really appreciate that. You know, it's funny, my my kids went to this place called iFly where they do this, <laughs> there's like this huge gush of wind and they have to wear all this like skydiving gear, even though they're in one place and kind of pushes them up and the, the trainer has to hold on to their arms and you have to hold on. Anyway, they are basically interlocked as they go up and up and up in this like very pretty circle. But I feel like that's exactly what you're saying about romantic love, right? You two are like in, you know, you're going through this big blast, but you have to hold on to each other to keep this dance sort of going and up in the air and all of that. Exactly that. Actually, another writer I'm into described it to me as like being in this current and, and the love is like, what holds you steady to each other whilst all the shit and the current everything is is flying (laughs) past you but what I would say is from doing this project I'm no expert at managing to sustain all these forms of love but I know how important they are I know that I don't just want to lose myself um, in motherhood and I, I feel not a desire but almost that could be inevitable if you didn't push back against it in some way you could just lose yourself in the intensity of it so I'm so glad that I've done this project because I know how important it is to sustain those other forms of love and so I feel like all the time I'm trying to sort of ring fence parts of myself and I'm sure like the work you do maybe for you is the same but for me conversations on love is actually a way of doing that Mm -hmm. it's like a little a little piece of me that's protected from motherhood somehow yes yep and I stake out that identity. <laughs> like, yeah. <laughs> put yeah, it out and, to the and, side. and also having something to come back to your friendships and relationships to talk about and having, you know, actually my husband bought me a piano for my birthday. And even just like having that kind of sense of newness in a way, like using your brain in a different, different way, I think is like that's almost like for me, the sustaining of the self-love. Oh, through okay. trying something or through giving yourself space to do to do something that's not worrying about your kid's temperature. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when the yes. thermometer is going red. Which of course like, is oh, out, no. of our, out, of, out of our control basically at all times, right? You know, all those things. But do you know what I think in, in romantic love is just to try and, for me, it's like to keep sharing the sort of uncomfortable truths like all the time even if I like resent my partner for something I know is not even really his fault or anyone's fault I just have to say it yeah and and then suddenly it's on the table and we talk about it and it's nothing but I think those little resentments if you don't if you just keep them quiet have like ways it's like a weed in the garden that just sort of grows into everything and then it's too difficult to to pull out it's very true although if you do that too much it's not good either (laughs) Yeah, maybe. I just wanted to read this one passage that you wrote. You said, and for people listening, if you hear background noise, my two sons happen to be in the room while I'm recording this. So, you know, do with that what you will, but it's summer. Okay, let me read this one passage. Have you ever felt the unbearable weight of not knowing? Have you ever thought, if only I could get a guarantee that I would one day get what I long for, then I would be able to relax? Or even if I knew that I would never get it, then at least I could design a different sort of life instead of wasting energy on waiting for what could be just around the corner. A longed for a relationship, a pregnancy, a job in a certain industry. Unless you believe in psychics, all of us will face some measure of this uncertainty. It's part and parcel of existence. Maybe there is comfort in knowing that whatever we have or don't have compared to each other, we share this same vulnerability to randomness. Every day we wake up with no clue of when we might die or what might happen when we do. How easily we forget this big question woven through everything. How small by comparison the other questions are. Not any less important, but perhaps more manageable in the context of it. Tell me more about this passage. Gosh, isn't this like the internal challenge for us all? I'm thinking, I was sort of, when I was writing, thinking specifically about really when I was trying to get pregnant after a miscarriage, thinking, okay, if this is never going to happen, I would rather know so I can say, right, let's not waste our years. Let's go traveling. Let's make a different plan. Or if it was going to happen in five years, I would be okay with that. You know, I'd be like, okay, well, we'll just shelve everything. And, but it's that wrestling with, I I think being in a state of wanting something is such a vulnerable place to be. I don't know. Have you, do you you watch succession probably like everybody? Yes, yes, yes. Yep. There's a line when Shiv says, 
when she's talking about just before that awkward dinner party where her dad kind of humiliates her she yeah. says to Tom she's like I really want this mm-hmm. and she says it in like a slightly softer more really different voice to we to any we heard her use before and in that moment she seems so vulnerable because she's being honest about how much she wants something and I think that that being honest you know even with yourself about really craving something. It just puts you, you're so exposed. You've got such a loss of control that can be so difficult to live with every day that I just fa- I just find it unbearable. <laughs> so many of us do. But that is also never going to change for any of us. And I think understanding that, just reminding yourself of that all the time is, is probably the biggest part of finding, of living a meaningful life. Because, you know, I and I'm terrible at this. Even now, I was saying to my husband last night, I think we should both get health MOTs. I think we should use our savings and just get scanned for cancer, get scanned for everything, you know, just so we know. And of course, you can never, you can never know or protect yourself from all those things. And I think in love, more than anything else, like living with that sense of mystery and seeing that, yes, for, for some people, you know, when you are in something like a, trying to get pregnant, it's so difficult. But there are also many instances of that uncertainty in life, which will lead to beautiful things. And and by the end of the book, like I always, because my parents met a teenager, as teenagers, as, as crazy as it sounds now, you know, that was what I wanted at the time. I was like, I'll meet a, a teenage sort of sweetheart at school and we'll be together forever and we'll have this depth of time and this long relationship and it'll be this beautiful love story and you know I'll get pregnant when I'm in my late 20s and just everything will follow this sort of ridiculous perfect pristine model and of course you know I'm I'm only now late 30s and none of those things (laughs) none of those things happened and I just think all the time thank god they didn't and how this sort of messy higgledy piggledy life with a few bruises along the way is so much more beautiful than any perfect love story that I have written if I didn't have all those moments of uncertainty so that's what came out of so many of my conversations of people living through those moments was there is a sort of beauty to uncertainty and I think like the line that people kind of share on Instagram at the at the end of it is I'd always thought of that as a negative thing but I wrote in that like not knowing what will happen next also means anything could Mm -hmm. and so I think a big part of the journey for me was saying yes it is impossible to live with that in many situations but it doesn't have to always be negative like there is a positive to uncertainty too that's true it's all about reframing right and also looking at the evidence of your life looking back and thinking of those moments you you really wrestled with that uncertainty and like there's a there's a great moment when Sarah Hapola who I don't know if you might have interviewed as, as well know. American mm-hmm. writer and um, she said she realizes she looks back at relationships that ended now and she was so devastated at the time and it's so arrogant that she thought she knew what was best for her mm-hmm. in those moments and looking back she didn't but but of course when you're in those moments you can't see that and and you don't always know what's best for you I mean, I also feel like this applies to writing itself. I mean, when you were talking about how much Shiv wanted, you know, the to run the company or whatever, you know, I I feel like in the past, and we had started by talking about how I have a book coming out too. Like, I was afraid to ex- to tell people like this is why this is like I really really want this, and I kept getting mm-hmm. rejected, and like it's embarrassing to kind of put yourself out there, and yet so important because once you do then you can A, find other people who feel the same way and B, realize that like, you know, it's okay to have goals and to want things and whether it's personal, professional or whatever, because that's really the crux of the message here in, in your story is like, you know, we don't know. We, ha- we can have goals, we can pursue goals, but ultimately it's all out of our hands. It's almost like the quote, you know, we, we make plans and God laughs, right? Like it's all... De- if, if we, and, and if we had just known, which I so relate to, like if I had just known like my, all my kids and the order in which they came and the years in which they came and how out of control I, even though I thought I was in control, I, I ultimately wasn't like, this is what happened. <laughs> and I think it might 
be something more that you understand even in like your 30s and 40s and probably way after that. But prior to that, I think it's really hard to believe in it because you don't know if it's going to work out or not. Maybe you're much better than I am then because I feel in in many ways just as I wrestle with this just as much now I think as I ever have and I, that's kind of one of the biggest lessons I learned in the book is that I sort of approached it all thinking right I'm going to learn this magical set of lessons so I'll be a great partner and a great daughter and a great friend and a great mother and now I just realize we're all going to keep making these mistakes all the time the the trick is sort of having these reminders that I hope these conversations will be for other people so that you, I guess, pull yourself back from making them more quickly. So even now I will, I will still like sit there thinking, Oh, I don't know that my daughter's going to be safe in this experience. And I will still like escalate and and be full of fear and all those things. But I just sort of now I think can like walk myself down from it a little bit more than running off the cliff. (laughs) I think it's just about how you handle anxiety, right? It's essentially that, right? It's anxiety based on fully understanding that life is unpredictable. You know, I I don't mean anxiety as in anxiety disorder. I mean the well-founded anxiety where life is uncertain and we can worry about that because as much as we reassure ourselves, anything really can happen. We can say the likelihood is low, right? But there is that possibility. Like we were just talking in the car this morning. It's the end of the school year here. And, you know, my two older kids are big and you know, going on to high school. And my little guys, I have so many years left. And I was just thinking, oh my gosh, I'm going to be dry doing this car car ride so many, for so many years. But then I said to everybody, I was like, you know what? And if I do, like how lucky that I get to li- I would get to live for those 10 years. And they were like, what? That's so depressing. But I'm like, yeah, but you don't know. It's not guaranteed. And I, I, I do think there is a way that being aware of that helps you to love better. Yes. Because I I guess that's what speaking to so many different people with so many different experiences of loss yes. and love has given me this sense. Like Anne Patchett put it well, where she said, like, we're all walking almost on this glass yes. bridge. And like every now and again, you look down and you realize, and you have these little moments in life, maybe like you find a lump and you're waiting for the result. And then, it's fine. But in that waiting room, you're suddenly aware of, of how close loss could be. And I write in the end about a moment when when our daughter, they thought she wasn't breathing and we were being resuscitated. Yes. She was being resuscitated was, in the ambulance. Oh my gosh, and so terrifying. On, but honestly, like, and then you just go back home and the next day everything's fine. But those moments where you almost skate so close to loss, I do think they change you in that, just I, I think that I have got better of the many things I am bad at I have got better at like when I'm feeling irritated with my husband or when I'm just like my daughter's driving me crazy I, I have this sense of living in this kind of golden moment where I have these people and that yeah I can be pissed off because I'm human and of course but I'm not going to be pissed off for too long because I don't want to waste the time I have yes that's so right that scene that you wrote was I was like holding my breath. And what I think you said, you said something in the book and I don't have the line in front of me. But, I mean, I have the book, but now of course I don't know where the line is, but you said something to the effect of like, but this is how it happens. Like in these moments from one moment to the next, these car, these ambulance rides, these calls, these, like it, that is how life changes. And it, and other people's lives did not, they didn't get better news and find out that she is breathing. Like this is just how it happens in the moment when, from one to the next. Anyway. I, I think that all the time that do when I walk a street and I see an ambulance mm-hmm. and it gives me this sort of chill where I think, well, I'm just meeting a friend for a drink and then what's happening there. Yeah. And, and, and the kind of situation that I wrote about and then the next day I was on Instagram and I saw a father who posted about he lost his child and he, she just had, he had the same sleepy suit from John Lewis, which is a store here as our daughter had. And I just, yep. I do think that we have to get better at, you know, people say, I can't imagine that, but I think we have to get better at imagining that so we can, you know, we can not be so separate from the people who are experiencing it and and they won't feel as lonely because we sort of don't want to go there mentally almost. Yes, I totally agree. I mean, anyone who's waited for 
a mammogram or a biopsy or, you know, that waiting. Anyone who's gone through the waiting of anything knows that there is another outcome, Mm. right? And I feel like, and that's, again, what I'm saying when you get older, I don't know, I feel like there's so many more opportunities for this, but... And when I said earlier, like, I don't feel like I am any better off than you. I feel like we're in very much the same emotional spot. I just think, I just think now I have the perspective that, you know, I'm still going to try my hardest for whatever it is I'm working towards or longing for or whatever. But if it doesn't happen, I do have this sense like, well, then maybe it wasn't supposed to be right now, but it doesn't mm. mean it's not going to happen ever. And maybe there's something bigger than me at work and maybe there's not, but maybe there is. And I just have to wait and see. So, do you know what? This is the trickiest thing I found writing about love is it's so full of contradictions because as you're saying that, that's such a big piece of it. But then there's also this big piece of it where I I feel like I was sort of embarrassed to try it love for a long Mm -hmm. time because I did expect it to just happen to me. And I was like, what will be will be. And I'll bump into somebody in a in a sort of dusty bookshop in the sunlight on a Sunday and then or I'll sit next down to them on a in a train and we'll fall in love and all these things will just sort of happen. And I have found you know, that is not the case. And actually all the all the hard won love in my life, like none of it has come easy. And all those things I had to really take a moment and say, I'm gonna really try at this and I'm gonna be vulnerable enough to try at it. So yeah, it's this really tricky balance between accepting randomness, as you say, but also knowing where to pour your effort into and actually that like love like anything else, if you don't try at it every day, then so easily. I mean, there's um you were saying you interviewed Mira Jacob. I love what she said to me about friends who divorced. And they'd say, oh, we had a rough, you know, really bad year. Yeah. And she'd say, well, they've been together for 20 years. Shouldn't it be like you have to have 10 bad years to undo mm-hmm. the marriage? And but that's not how it works. It can it can slip so easily. Um, so, yeah, I would say that's that's where I've got to now is like constantly assessing like when to sort of peacefully submit to the mystery and when to think, hang on, no backup. I need to do something here. I need to put more effort in. I need to. Yep. You know, have a conversation. I need to change something. Love it. Okay. Well, we could clearly talk all day about this, um, <laughs> but these are just. Can I just ask you one question? Of course. Sure. Can I ask you because I know you know you you have got four children, you have got such an incredible career, and you're what what do you think you've learned about sustaining romantic love amidst all that? Have you? I'm I'm interested to hear your take on it. I'm I'm divorced and I'm remarried. So take with that how you will. My, I've been married now for five years to my second husband. And I guess I will say it's a challenge, but I think you have to really, you know, I mean, this is going to sound hokey, you know, almost like it's in one of those action movies where there's this gem sort of in a protective clear case sort of glimmering, you know, and everybody's like trying to get there and it's like at the center of everything. Like, I think you have to view it like that, like this very precious, very delicate thing in the middle. And that middle is what's holding the rest together. So, I mean, on a tactical level, time spent attention, you know, so a girlfriend of mine once told me, even if you spend, I think two minutes a day of like intense eye contact it, it can sustain you for a long time. Like if you just really listen and have a moment of connection for two minutes in the morning and then maybe another one in the middle of the day and then another one at night, like you only need like five minutes a day to make sure that, but you have to connect daily and look in their eyes and make sure. But I don't know. I'm just, I'm not always the best. I get very busy and distracted and probably don't do the best job myself, but uh, I like that. I think kissing as well, it's kind of a similar Thing. I think it's really easy to stop kissing. Mm. And when I'm more conscious of that, I think that makes a big difference. Anyway, yeah, yeah we could we could talk for hours about this. Yeah. Okay. Well, to be continued, hopefully at some point, yeah. um, these philosophical issues of love and life and how things unfold and, and all of that. But at the end of it, being someone who thinks about it a lot and is very sensitive, I, I also think helps, even though it can be frustrating, having the mm. awareness and not and, and seeing it as a full picture, the way you do in your book, I think is is very helpful. And are also all the perspectives. So anyway, 
<laughs> this was very little about the book, which I did read all of and really enjoyed and found very thought provoking. And anyway, people listening, Conversations on Love, Natasha Lund, you can hear more of uh, these conversations and hopefully we'll continue ours one day. Thank you so much. Lee. Thank all you. right. Take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Sorry about my kids. <laughs> No, thank you. Bye. Thanks for listening to this episode of Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram at Zibby Owens and at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Also sign up for my newsletter at ZibbyOwens.com and sign up for my virtual book club and meet lots of authors on Zoom every other week. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. 